Uncle Jeremy's Household Chapter 1 My life has been a somewhat checkered one, and it has fallen to my lot during the course of it to have had several unusual experiences. There is one episode, however, which is so surpassingly strange that whenever I look back to it, it reduces the others to insignificance. It looms up out of the mists of the past, gloomy and fantastic, overshadowing the eventless years which preceded and which followed it. It is not a story which I have often told. A few, but only a few, who know me well have heard the facts from my lips. I have been asked from time to time by these to narrate them to some assemblage of friends, but I have invariably refused, for I have no desire to gain a reputation as an amateur Munchausen. I have yielded to their wishes, however, so far as to draw up this written statement of the facts in connection with my visit to Dunkelthwaite. Here is John Thurston's first letter to me. It is dated April 1862. I take it from my desk and copy it as it stands. My dear Lawrence, if you knew my utter loneliness and complete ennui, I am sure you would have pity upon me and come up to share my solitude. You have often made vague promises of visiting Dunkelthwaite and having a look at the Yorkshire Fells. What time could suit you better than the present? Of course, I understand that you are hard at work, but as you are not actually taking out classes, you can read just as well here as in Baker Street. Pack up your books like a good fellow and come along. We have a snug little room with writing desk and armchair, which will just do for your study. Let me know when we may expect you. When I say that I am lonely, I do not mean that there is any lack of people in the house. On the contrary, we form rather a large household. First and foremost, of course, comes my poor Uncle Jeremy, garrulous and imbecile, shuffling about in his list slippers and composing, as is his wont, innumerable bad verses. I think I told you when last we met of that trait in his character— it has attained such a pitch that he has an amanuensis, whose sole duty it is to copy down and preserve these effusions. This fellow, whose name is Copperthorn, has become as necessary to the old man as his fool's cap, or as the universal rhyming dictionary. I can't say I care for him myself but then I have always shared Caesar's prejudice against lean men, though, by the way, little Julius was rather inclined that way himself, if we may believe the medals. Then we have the two children of my uncle Samuel, who were adopted by Jeremy. There were three of them, but one has gone the way of all flesh, and their governess, a stylish-looking brunette, with Indian blood in her veins. Besides all these, there are three maidservants and the old groom. So you see we have quite a little world of our own in this out-of-the-way corner. For all that, my dear Hugh, I long for a familiar face and for a congenial companion. I am deep in chemistry myself, so I won't interrupt your studies. Write by return to your isolated friend, John H. Thurston. At the time that I received this letter, I was in lodgings in London, and was working hard for the final examination which should make me a qualified medical man. Thurston and I had been close friends at Cambridge before I took to the study of medicine, and I had a great desire to see him again. 
On the other hand, I was rather afraid that, in spite of his assurances, my studies might suffer by the change. I pictured to myself the childish old man, the lean secretary, the stylish governess, the two children probably spoiled and noisy. And I came to the conclusion that when we were all cooped together in one country house, there would be very little room for quiet reading. At the end of two days' cogitation, I'd almost made up my mind to refuse the invitation, when I received another letter from Yorkshire, even more pressing than the first. "'We expect to hear from you by every post,' my friend said, "'and there is never a knock that I do not think it is a telegram announcing your train. Your room is all ready, and I think you will find it comfortable. Uncle Jeremy bids me say how very happy he will be to see you. He would have written, but he is absorbed in a great epic poem of five thousand lines or so, and he spends his day trotting about the rooms, while Copperthorne stalks behind him, like the monster in Frankenstein, with notebook and pencil, jotting down the words of wisdom as they drop from his lips. By the way, I think I mentioned the brunettish governess to you. I might throw her out as a bait to you, if you retain your taste for ethnological studies. She is the child of an Indian chieftain, whose wife was an Englishwoman. He was killed in the mutiny, fighting against us, and his estates being seized by government, his daughter, then fifteen, was left almost destitute. Some charitable German merchant in Calcutta adopted her, it seems, and brought her over to Europe with him, together with his own daughter. The latter died, and then Miss Warrender, as we call her, after her mother, answered Uncle's advertisement, and here she is. Now, my dear boy, stand not upon the order of your coming, but come at once. There were other things in this second letter, which prevent me from quoting it in full, there was no resisting the importunity of my old friend, so, with many inward grumbles, I hastily packed up my books and, having telegraphed overnight, started for Yorkshire the first thing in the morning. I well remember that it was a miserable day, and that the journey seemed to be an interminable one, as I sat huddled up in a corner of the draughty carriage, revolving in my mind many problems of surgery and of medicine. I had been warned that the little wayside station of Ingleton, some fifteen miles from Carnforth, was the nearest to my destination, and there I alighted, just as John Thurston came dashing down the country road in a high dog-cart. He waved his whip enthusiastically at the sight of me, and pulling up his horse with a jerk, sprang out and onto the platform. "'My dear Hugh!' he cried. "'I'm so delighted to see you. "'It's so kind of you to come.' "'He wrung my hand until my arm ached. "'I'm afraid you'll find me very bad company now that I'm here,' I answered. "'I'm up to my eyes in work.' "'Of course, of course,' he said in his good-humoured way. "'I reckoned on this. "'We'll have time for a crack at the rabbits for all that. "'It's a longish drive, and you must be bitterly cold.' So, let's start for home at once. We rattled off along the dusty road. I think you'll like your room, my friend remarked. You'll soon find yourself at home. You know, it is not often that I visit Dunkelthwaite myself, and I am only just beginning to settle down and get my laboratory in working order. I've been here for a fortnight. It's an open secret that I occupy a prominent position in old Uncle Jeremy's will— so my father thought it only right that I should come up and do the polite. Under the circumstances I can hardly do less than put myself out a little now and again. Certainly not, I said, and besides, he's a very good old fellow. You'll be amused at our menage. A princess for a governess. It sounds well, doesn't it? 
I think our imperturbable secretary is somewhat gone in that direction. Turn up your coat collar, for the wind is very sharp. The road ran over a succession of low, bleak hills, which were devoid of all vegetation save a few scattered gorse bushes and a thin covering of stiff, wiry grass, which gave nourishment to a scattered flock of lean, hungry-looking sheep. Alternately, we dipped down into a hollow, or rose to the summit of an eminence from which we could see the road winding as a thin white track over successive hills beyond. Every here and there, the monotony of the landscape was broken by jagged scarps, where the grey granite peeped grimly out, as though nature had been sorely wounded until her gaunt bones protruded through their covering. In the distance lay a range of mountains, with one great peak shooting up from amongst them coquettishly draped in a wreath of clouds which reflected the ruddy light of the setting sun. "'That's Ingleborough," my companion said, indicating the mountain with his whip, "'and these are the Yorkshire Fells. You won't find a wilder, bleaker place in all England. They breed a good race of men, the raw militia who beat the Scotch cavalry at the Battle of the Standard came from this part of the country. Just jump down, old fellow, and open the gate.' We had pulled up at a place where a long, moss-grown wall ran parallel to the road. It was broken by a dilapidated iron gate, flanked by two pillars, on the summit of which were stone devices which appeared to represent some heraldic animal, though wind and rain had reduced them to shapeless blocks. A ruined cottage, which may have served at some time as a lodge, stood on one side. I pushed the gate open and we drove up a long, winding avenue, grass-grown and uneven, but lined by magnificent oaks, which shot their branches so thickly over us that the evening twilight deepened suddenly into darkness. "'I'm afraid our avenue won't impress you much,' Thurston said with a laugh. "'It's one of the old man's whims to let nature have her way in everything. "'Here we are at last.' A Dunkelthwaite. As he spoke, we swung round a curve in the avenue, marked by a patriarchal oak, which towered high above the others, and came upon a great square whitewashed house with a lawn in front of it. The lower part of the building was all in shadow, but up at the top a row of bloodshot windows glimmered out at the setting sun. At the sound of the wheels, an old man in livery ran out and seized the horse's head when we pulled up. "'You can put her up, Elijah,' my friend said as we jumped down. "'Hugh, let me introduce you to my Uncle Jeremy. "'How do you do? How do you do?' cried a wheezy, cracked voice. And looking up, I saw a little red-faced man who was standing waiting for us in the porch." He wore a cotton cloth tied round his head after the fashion of Pope and other eighteenth-century celebrities, and was further distinguished by a pair of enormous slippers. These contrasted so strangely with his thin spindle shanks that he appeared to be wearing snowshoes, a resemblance which was heightened by the fact that when he walked he was compelled to slide his feet along the ground in order to retain his grip of these unwieldy appendages. "'You must be tired, sir, yes, and cold, sir,' he said in a strange, jerky way, as he shook me by the hand. "'We must be hospitable to you, we must indeed. Hospitality is one of the old-world virtues which we still retain. Let me see, what are those lines? Ready and strong the Yorkshire arm, but all oh, the Yorkshire heart is warm.' Neat and terse, sir, that comes from one of my poems. What poem is it, Copperthorn? The Harrying of Borrowdale, said a voice behind him, and a tall, long-visaged man stepped forward into the circle of light which was thrown by the lamp above the porch. John introduced us. 
and I remembered that his hand as I shook it was cold and unpleasantly clammy. This ceremony over, my friend led the way to my room, passing through many passages and corridors connected by old-fashioned and irregular staircases. I noticed as I passed the thickness of the walls and the strange slants and angles of the ceilings, suggestive of mysterious spaces above. The chamber set apart for me proved, as John had said, to be a cheery little sanctum with a crackling fire and a well-stocked bookcase. I began to think, as I pulled on my slippers, that I might have done worse after all than accept this Yorkshire invitation. Chapter 2 When we descended to the dining room, the rest of the household had already assembled for dinner. Old Jeremy, still wearing his quaint headgear, sat at the head of the table. Next to him, on his right, sat a very dark young lady with black hair and eyes, who was introduced to me as Miss Warrender. Beside her were two pretty children, a boy and a girl, who were evidently her charges. I sat opposite her with Copperthorn on my left, while John faced his uncle. I can almost fancy now that I can see the yellow glare of the great oil lamp throwing Rembrandt-like lights and shades upon the ring of faces, some of which were soon to have so strange an interest for me. It was a pleasant meal, apart from the excellence of the viands and the fact that the long journey had sharpened my appetite. Uncle Jeremy overflowed with anecdote and quotation, delighted to have found a new listener. Neither Miss Warrender nor Copperthorne spoke much, but all that the latter said bespoke the thoughtful and educated man. As to John, he had so much to say of college reminiscences and subsequent events that I fear his dinner was a scanty one. When the dessert was put on the table, Miss Warrender took the children away and Uncle Jeremy withdrew into the library, where we could hear the dull murmur of his voice as he dictated to his amanuensis. My old friend and I sat for some time before the fire discussing the many things which had happened to both of us since our last meeting. "'And what do you think of our household?' he asked at last, with a smile. I answered that I was very much interested with what I had seen of it. "'Your uncle,' said I, "'is quite a character. I like him very much. Yes, he has a warm heart behind all his peculiarities. Your coming seems to have cheered him up, for he's never been quite himself since little Ethel's death. She was the youngest of Uncle Sam's children, and came here with the others. But she had a fit or something in the shrubbery a couple of months ago.' They found her lying dead there in the evening. It was a great blow to the old man. It must have been to Miss Warrender, too, I remarked. Yes, she was very much cut up. She had only been here a week or two at the time. She had driven over to Kirby Lonsdale that day to buy something. I was very much interested, I said, in all that you told me about her. You were not chaffing, I suppose. No, no, it's true as gospel— her father was Ahmet Genghis Khan, a semi-independent chieftain somewhere in the central provinces. He was a bit of a heathen fanatic, in spite of his Christian wife, and he became chummy with the Nana, and mixed himself up in the cornpore business, so government came down heavily on him. She must have been quite a woman before she left her tribe, I said. What view of religion does she take? Does she side with her father or mother? We never press that question, my friend answered. Between ourselves, I don't think she's very orthodox. Her mother must have been a good woman, and besides teaching her English, she is a good French scholar and plays remarkably well. Why, there she goes. As he spoke, the sound of a piano was heard from the next room, and we both paused to listen. At first the player struck a few isolated notes as though uncertain how to proceed. Then came a series of clanging chords and jarring discords 
until out of the chaos there suddenly swelled a strange barbaric march, with blare of trumpet and crash of cymbal. Louder and louder it pealed forth in a gust of wild melody, and then died away once more into the jerky chords which had preceded it. Then we heard the sound of the shutting of the piano, and the music was at an end. She does that every night, my friend remarked. I suppose it is some Indian reminiscence. Picturesque, don't you think so? Now, don't stay here longer than you wish. Your room is ready whenever you would like to study. I took my companion at his word, and left him with his uncle and Copperthorne, who had returned into the room, while I went upstairs and read medical jurisprudence for a couple of hours. I imagined that I should see no more of the inhabitants of Dunkelthwaite that night, but I was mistaken. For about ten o'clock Uncle Jeremy thrust his little red face into the room. "'All comfortable?' he asked. "'Excellent, thanks,' I answered. "'That's right. Keep at it. Sure to succeed,' he said in his spasmodic way. "'Good night.' "'Good night,' I answered. "'Good night,' said another voice from the passage. And looking out I saw the tall figure of the secretary gliding along at the old man's heels like a long, dark shadow. I went back to my desk and worked for another hour after which I retired to bed, where I pondered for some time before I dropped to sleep over the curious household of which I had become a member. Chapter 3 I was up betimes in the morning and out on the lawn, where I found Miss Warrender, who was picking primroses and making them into a little bunch for the breakfast table. I approached her before she saw me, and I could not help admiring the beautiful litheness of her figure as she stooped over the flowers. There was a feline grace about her every movement, such as I never remember to have seen in any woman. I recalled Thurston's words as to the impression which she had made upon the secretary, and ceased to wonder at it. As she heard my step, she stood up and turned her dark, handsome face towards me. "'Good morning, Miss Warrender,' I said. "'You are an early riser like myself.' "'Yes,' she answered. "'I have always been accustomed to rise at daybreak.' "'What a strange, wild view,' I remarked, looking out over the wide stretch of fells. "'I'm a stranger to this part of the country, like yourself. "'How do you like it?' "'I don't like it,' she said frankly. I detest it. It is cold and bleak and wretched. Look at these, holding up her bunch of primroses. They call these things flowers. They have not even a smell. You have been used to a more genial climate and a tropical vegetation. Oh, then Mr. Thurston has been telling you about me, she said with a smile. Yes, I have been used to something better than this. We were standing together when a shadow fell between us, and looking round I found that Copperthorne was standing close behind us. He held out his thin white hand to me with a constrained smile. "'You seem to be able to find your way about already,' he remarked, glancing backwards and forwards from my face to that of Miss Warrender. "'Let me hold your flowers for you, miss.' "'No, thank you,' the other said coldly. "'I have picked enough.' and am going inside. She swept past him and across the lawn to the house. Copperthorne looked after her with a frowning brow. You are a student of medicine, Mr. Lawrence, he said, turning towards me and stamping one of his feet up and down in a jerky, nervous fashion as he spoke. Yes, I am. Oh, we have heard of you students of medicine, he cried in a raised voice with a little crackling laugh. You are dreadful fellows, are you not? We have heard of you. There is no standing against you. A medical student, sir, I answered, is usually a gentleman. Quite so, he said in a changed voice. Of course, I was only joking. Nevertheless, I could not help noticing that at breakfast he kept his eyes persistently fixed upon me, while Miss Warrender was speaking, 
and if I chanced to make a remark, he would flash a glance round at her as though to read in our faces what our thoughts were of each other. It was clear that he took a more than common interest in the beautiful governess, and it seemed to me to be equally evident that his feelings were by no means reciprocated. We had an illustration that morning of the simple nature of these primitive Yorkshire folk. It appears that the housemaid and the cook, who sleep together, were alarmed during the night by something which their superstitious minds contorted into an apparition. I was sitting after breakfast with Uncle Jeremy, who, with the help of continual promptings from his secretary, was reciting some border poetry, when there was a tap at the door and the housemaid appeared. Close at her heels came the cook, buxom but timorous, the two mutually encouraging and abetting each other. They told their story in a strophe and antistrophe, like a Greek chorus, Jane talking until her breath failed, when the narrative was taken up by the cook, who in turn was supplanted by the other. Much of what they said was almost unintelligible to me, owing to their extraordinary dialect, but I could make out the main thread of their story. It appears that in the early morning the cook had been awakened by something touching her face, and starting up had seen a shadowy figure standing by her bed, which figure had at once glided noiselessly from the room. The housemaid was awakened by the cook's cry, and averred stoutly that she had seen the apparition. No amount of cross-examination or reasoning could shake them, and they wound up by both giving notice, which was a practical way of showing that they were honestly scared. They seemed considerably indignant at our want of belief, and ended by bouncing out of the room, leaving Uncle Jeremy angry, Copperthorne contemptuous, and myself very much amused. I spent nearly the whole of the second day of my visit in my room, and got over a considerable amount of work. In the evening John and I went down to the rabbit warren with our guns. I told John as we came back of the absurd scene with the servants in the morning, but it did not seem to strike him in the same ridiculous light that it had me— the fact is, he said, in very old houses like ours, where you have the timber rotten and warped, you get curious effects sometimes which predispose the mind to superstition. I have heard one or two things at night during this visit which might have frightened a nervous man, and still more an uneducated servant. Of course, all this about apparitions is mere nonsense— but when once the imagination is excited, there's no checking it. "'What have you heard, then?' I asked with interest. "'Oh, nothing of any importance,' he answered. "'Here are the youngsters and Miss Warrender. We mustn't talk about these things before her, or else we shall have her giving warning too, and that would be a loss to the establishment.' She was sitting on a little stile, which stood on the outskirts of the wood which surrounds Dunkelthwaite, and the two children were leaning up against her, one on either side, with their hands clasped round her arms, and their chubby faces turned up to hers. It was a pretty picture, and we both paused to look at it. She had heard our approach, however, and, springing lightly down, she came towards us, with the two little ones toddling behind her. "'You must aid me with the weight of your authority,' she said to John, these little rebels are fond of the night air, and won't be persuaded to come indoors. Don't want to come, said the boy with decision. Want to hear the rest of the story? Yes, the Tory, lisped the younger one. You shall hear the rest of the story tomorrow, if you are good. Here is Mr. Lawrence, who is a doctor. He will tell you how bad it is for little boys and girls to be out when the dew falls. So, have you been hearing a story? "'John said as we moved on together. "'Yes, such a good story,' the little chap said with enthusiasm. "'Uncle Jeremy tells us stories, but they are in poetry, "'and they are not nearly so nice as Miss Warrender's stories. "'This one was about elephants.' "'And tigers and gold,' said the other. "'Yes, and wars and fighting, and the king of the Cheroots.' "'Rajputs, my dear,' said the governess. 
and the scattered tribes that know each other by signs, and the man that was killed in the wood. She knows splendid stories. Why don't you make her tell you some, Cousin John? Really, Miss Warrender, you have excited our curiosity, my companion said. You must tell us of these wonders. They would seem stupid enough to you, she answered with a laugh. They are merely a few reminiscences of my early life. As we strolled along the pathway which led through the wood, we met Copperthorn coming from the opposite direction. "'I was looking for you all,' he said, with an ungainly attempt at geniality. "'I wanted to tell you that it was dinner-time.' "'Our watches told us that,' said John, rather ungraciously, as I thought. "'And you have all been rabbiting together?' the secretary continued, as he stalked along beside us. Not at all, I answered. We met Miss Warrender and the children on our way back. Oh, Miss Warrender came to meet you as you came back, said he. This quick contortion of my words, together with the sneering way in which he spoke, vexed me so much that I should have made a sharp rejoinder had it not been for the lady's presence. I happened to turn my eyes towards the governess at the moment, and I saw her glance at the speaker with an angry sparkle in her eyes, which showed that she shared my indignation. I was surprised, however, that same night, when about ten o'clock I chanced to look out of the window of my study, to see the two of them walking up and down in the moonlight, engaged in deep conversation. I don't know how it was, but the sight disturbed me so much that after several fruitless attempts to continue my studies, I threw my books aside and gave up work for the night. About eleven I glanced out again, but they were gone, and shortly afterwards I heard the shuffling step of Uncle Jeremy and the firm heavy footfall of the secretary as they ascended the staircase which led to their bedrooms upon the upper floor. Chapter 4 John Thurston was never a very observant man, and I believed that before I had been three days under his uncle's roof, I knew more of what was going on there than he did. My friend was ardently devoted to chemistry, and spent his days happily among his test tubes and solutions, perfectly contented so long as he had a genial companion at hand to whom he could communicate his results. For myself, I have always had a weakness for the study and analysis of human character, and I found much that was interesting in the microcosm in which I lived. Indeed, I became so absorbed in my observations that I fear my studies suffered to a considerable extent. In the first place, I discovered beyond all doubt that the real master of Dunkelthwaite was not Uncle Jeremy, but Uncle Jeremy's amanuensis. My medical instinct told me that the absorbing love of poetry, which had been nothing more than a harmless eccentricity in the old man's younger days, had now become a complete monomania, which filled his mind to the exclusion of every other subject. Copperthorne, by humouring his employer upon this one point, until he had made himself indispensable to him, had succeeded in gaining complete power over him in everything else. He managed his money matters and the affairs of the house unquestioned and uncontrolled. He had sense enough, however, to exert his authority so lightly that it galled no one's neck and therefore excited no opposition. My friend, busy with his distillations and analyses, was never allowed to realise that he was really a non-entity in the establishment. I have already expressed my conviction that though Copperthorne had some tender feelings for the governess, she by no means favoured his addresses. After a few days I came to think, however, that there existed, besides this unrequited affection, some other link which bound the pair together. I had seen him more than once assume an air towards her which can only be described as one of authority— Two or three times also I had observed them pacing the lawn and conversing earnestly in the early hours of the night. I could not guess what mutual understanding existed between them, and the mystery piqued my curiosity. 
It is proverbially easy to fall in love in a country house, but my nature has never been a sentimental one, and my judgment was not warped by any such feeling towards Miss Warrender. On the contrary, I set myself to study her as an entomologist might a specimen, critically but without bias. With this object I used to arrange my studies in such a way as to be free at the times when she took the children out for exercise, so that we had many walks together, and I gained a deeper insight into her character than I should otherwise have done. She was fairly well read and had a superficial acquaintance with several languages, as well as a great natural taste for music. Underneath this veneer of culture, however, there was a great dash of the savage in her nature. In the course of her conversation she would, every now and again, drop some remark which would almost startle me by its primitive reasoning and by its disregard for the conventionalities of civilization. I could hardly wonder at this, however, when I reflected that she had been a woman before she left the wild tribe which her father ruled. I remember one instance which struck me as particularly characteristic, in which her wild original habits suddenly asserted themselves. We were walking along the country road, talking of Germany, in which she had spent some months, when she suddenly stopped short and laid her finger upon her lips. "'Lend me your stick,' she said in a whisper. I handed it to her, and at once, to my astonishment, she darted lightly and noiselessly through a gap in the hedge, and, bending her body, crept swiftly along under the shelter of a little knoll. I was still looking after her in amazement, when a rabbit rose suddenly in front of her and scuttled away. She hurled the stick after it and struck it, but the creature made good its escape though trailing one leg behind it. She came back to me exultant and panting. I saw it move among the grass, she said. I hit it. Yes, you hit it. You broke its leg, I said somewhat coldly. You hurt it, the little boy cried ruefully. Poor little beast, she exclaimed, with a sudden change in her whole manner. I am sorry I harmed it. She seemed completely cast down by the incident and spoke little during the remainder of our walk. For my own part, I could not blame her much. It was evidently an outbreak of the old predatory instinct of the savage, though with a somewhat incongruous effect in the case of a fashionably dressed young lady on an English high road. John Thurston made me peep into her private sitting-room one day when she was out, she had a thousand little Indian knick-knacks there which showed that she had come well laden from her native land. Her oriental love for bright colours had exhibited itself in an amusing fashion. She had gone down to the market town and bought numerous sheets of pink and blue paper, and these she had pinned in patches over the sombre covering which had lined the walls before. She had some tinsel too, which she had put up in the most conspicuous places. The whole effect was ludicrously tawdry and glaring, and yet there seemed to me to be a touch of pathos in this attempt to reproduce the brilliance of the tropics in the cold English dwelling-house. During the first few days of my visit, the curious relationship which existed between Miss Warrender and the secretary had simply excited my curiosity. But as the weeks passed and I became more interested in the beautiful Anglo-Indian, a deeper and more personal feeling took possession of me. I puzzled my brains as to what tie could exist between them. Why was it that while she showed every symptom of being averse to his company during the day, she should walk about with him alone after nightfall? Could it be that the distaste which she showed for him before others was a blind to conceal her real feelings? Such a supposition seemed to involve a depth of dissimulation in her nature which appeared to be incompatible with her frank eyes and clear-cut, proud features. And yet what other hypothesis could account for the power which he most certainly exercised over her? 
This power showed itself in many ways, but was exerted so quietly and silently that none but a close observer could have known that it existed. I have seen him glance at her with a look so commanding and, as it seemed to me, so menacing, that next moment I could hardly believe that his white, impassive face could be capable of so intense an expression. When he looked at her in this manner, she would wince and quiver, as though she had been in physical pain. Decidedly, I thought, it is fear and not love which produces such effects. I was so interested in the question that I spoke to my friend John about it. He was in his little laboratory at the time and was deeply immersed in a series of manipulations and distillations, which ended in the production of an evil-smelling gas, which set us both coughing and choking. I took advantage of our enforced retreat into the fresh air to question him upon one or two points on which I wanted information. "'How long did you say that Miss Warrender had been with your uncle?' I asked. John looked at me slyly and shook his acid-stained finger. "'You seem to be wonderfully interested about the daughter of the late-lamented Ahmet Genghis,' he said. "'Who could help it?' I answered frankly. "'I think she is one of the most romantic characters I ever met. "'Take care of the studies, my boy,' John said paternally. "'This sort of thing doesn't do before examinations. "'Don't be ridiculous,' I remonstrated. "'Anyone would think that I was in love with Miss Warrender "'to hear the way in which you talk. "'I look on her as an interesting psychological problem, nothing more.' "'Quite so. "'An interesting psychological problem, nothing more.' John seemed to have some of the vapours of the gas still hanging about his system, for his manner was decidedly irritating. To revert to my original question, I said, how long has she been here? About ten weeks. And Copperthorne? Over two years. Do you imagine that they could have known each other before? Impossible, said John with decision. She came from Germany. I saw the letter from the old merchant in which he traced her previous life. Copperthorne has always been in Yorkshire, except for two years at Cambridge. He had to leave the university under a cloud. What sort of a cloud? Don't know, John answered. They kept it very quiet. I fancy Uncle Jeremy knows. He's very fond of taking rapscallions up and giving them what he calls another start. Some of them will give him a start some of these fine days. And so Copperthorne and Miss Warrender were absolute strangers until the last few weeks. Quite so. And now I think we can go back and analyse the sediment. Never mind the sediment, I cried, detaining him. There's more I want to talk to you about. If these two have only known each other for this short time, how has he managed to gain his power over her? John stared at me open-eyed. His power, he said. Yes, the power which he exercises over her. My dear Hugh, my friend said gravely. I'm not in the habit of thus quoting scripture, but there is one text which occurs irresistibly to my mind, and that is that much learning hath made thee mad. You've been reading too hard. Do you mean to say, I cried, that you have never observed that there is some secret understanding between your uncle's governess and his amanuensis? Try bromide of potassium, said John. It's very soothing in twenty grain doses. Try a pair of spectacles, I retorted. You most certainly need them with which, parting shot, I turned on my heel and went off in high dudgeon. I had not gone twenty yards down the gravel walk of the garden before I saw the very couple of whom we had just been speaking. They were some little way off, she leaning against the sundial, he standing in front of her and speaking earnestly, with occasional jerky gesticulations with his tall gaunt figure towering above her and the spasmodic motions of his long arms. He might have been some great bat fluttering over a victim. I remember that that was the simile which rose in my mind at the time, heightened perhaps by the suggestion of shrinking and of fear, which seemed to me to lie in every curve of her beautiful figure. The little picture was such an illustration of the text upon which I had been preaching that I had half a mind to go back to the laboratory and bring the incredulous John out to witness it. 
Before I had time to come to a conclusion, however, Copperthorn caught a glimpse of me and, turning away, he strolled slowly in the opposite direction into the shrubbery, his companion walking by his side and cutting at the flowers as she passed with her sunshade. I went up to my room after this small episode with the intention of pushing on with my studies, but do what I would, my mind wandered away from my books in order to speculate upon this mystery. I had learned from John that Copperthorne's antecedents were not of the best, and yet he had obviously gained enormous power over his almost imbecile employer. I could understand this fact by observing the infinite pains with which he devoted himself to the old man's hobby, and the consummate tact with which he humoured and encouraged his strange poetic whims. But how could I account for the, to me, equally obvious power which he wielded over the governess? She had no whims to be humoured. Mutual love might account for the tie between them, but my instinct as a man of the world and as an observer of human nature told me most conclusively that no such love existed. If not love, it must be fear, a supposition which was favoured by all that I had seen. What then had occurred during these two months to cause this high-spirited, dark-eyed princess to fear the white-faced Englishman with the soft voice and the gentle manner? That was the problem which I set myself to solve with an energy and earnestness which eclipsed my ardour for study and rendered me superior to the terrors of my approaching examination. I ventured to approach the subject that same afternoon to Miss Warrender, whom I found alone in the library, the two little children having gone to spend the day in the nursery of a neighbouring squire. "'You must be rather lonely when there are no visitors,' I remarked. "'It does not seem to be a very lively part of the country.' "'Children are always good companions,' she answered. "'Nevertheless, I shall miss both Mr Thornton and yourself very much when you go. "'I shall be very sorry when the time comes,' I said. "'I never expected to enjoy this visit as I have done. "'Still, you won't be quite companionless when we are gone. "'You'll always have Mr Copperthorn. "'Yes, we shall always have Mr Copperthorn.' "'She spoke with a weary intonation. "'He's a pleasant companion,' I remarked. "'Quiet, well-informed, and amiable. "'I don't wonder that old Mr Thurston is so fond of him.' "'As I spoke in this way, I watched my companion intently. "'There was a slight flush on her dark cheeks, "'and she drummed her fingers impatiently against the arms of the chair. "'His manner may be a little cold sometimes.' I was continuing, but she interrupted me, turning on me furiously with an angry glare in her black eyes. "'What do you want to talk to me about him for?' she asked. "'I beg pardon,' I answered submissively. "'I did not know it was a forbidden subject. I don't wish ever to hear his name,' she cried passionately. "'I hate it, and I hate him. Oh, if I had only someone who loved me! That is, as men love, away over the seas in my own land. I know what I should say to him.' "'What would you say?' I asked, astonished at this extraordinary outburst. She leaned forward until I seemed to feel the quick pants of her warm breath upon my face. "'Kill Copperthorne,' she said. "'That is what I should say to him. Kill Copperthorne. Then you can come and talk of love to me.' Nothing can describe the intensity of fierceness with which she hissed these words out from between her white teeth. She looked so venomous as she spoke that I involuntarily shrank away from her. Could this pythoness be the demure young lady who sat every day so primly and quietly at the table of Uncle Jeremy? I had hoped to gain some insight into her character by my leading question, but I had never expected to conjure up such a spirit as this. She must have seen the horror and surprise which was depicted on my face— for her manner changed, and she laughed nervously. "'You must really think me mad,' she said. "'You see, it is the Indian training breaking out again. We do nothing by halves over there, either loving or hating. And why is it that you hate Mr. Copperthorne?' I asked. "'Ah, well,' she answered in a subdued voice, "'perhaps hate is rather too strong a term, after all. 
Dislike would be better. There are some people you cannot help having an antipathy to, even though you are unable to give any exact reason. It was evident that she regretted her recent outburst, and was endeavouring to explain it away. As I saw that she wished to change the conversation, I aided her to do so, and made some remark about a book of Indian prints which she had taken down before I came in, and which still lay upon her lap. Uncle Jeremy's collection was an extensive one, and was particularly rich in works of this class. They are not very accurate, she said, turning over the many-coloured leaves. This is good, though, she continued, picking out a picture of a chieftain clad in chain-mail, with a picturesque turban upon his head. This is very good indeed. My father was dressed like that when he rode down on his white charger and led all the warriors of the Duab to do battle with the Feringhees. My father was chosen out from amongst them all, for they knew that Ahmed Genghis Khan was a great priest as well as a great soldier. The people would be led by none but a tried Borka. He is dead now, and of all those who followed his banner, there are none who are not scattered or slain, whilst I, his daughter, am a servant in a far land. No doubt you will go back to India some day, I said, in a somewhat feeble attempt at consolation. She turned the pages over listlessly for a few moments without answering. Then she gave a sudden little cry of pleasure as she paused at one of the prints. Look at this, she cried eagerly. It is one of our wanderers. He is a butoti. It is very like. The picture which excited her so was one which represented a particularly uninviting-looking native with a small instrument which looked like a miniature pickaxe in one hand and a striped handkerchief or roll of linen in the other. "'That handkerchief is his rumal,' she said. "'Of course, he wouldn't go about with it openly like that, nor would he bear the sacred axe. But in every other respect he is as he should be. Many a time have I been with such—' upon the moonless nights when the Luahis were on ahead and the heedless stranger heard the Pilau away to the left and knew not what it might mean. Ah, that was a life that was worth the living. And what may a Rumal be, and the Luahi, and all the rest of it? I asked. Oh, they are Indian terms, she answered with a laugh. You would not understand them. But, I said, this picture is marked as dacoit, and I always thought that a dacoit was a robber. That is because the English know no better, she observed. Of course, dacoits are robbers, but they call many people robbers who are not really so. Now this man is a holy man, and, in all probability, a guru. She might have given me more information upon Indian manners and customs, for it was a subject upon which she loved to talk. But suddenly, as I watched her, I saw a change come over her face, and she gazed with a rigid stare at the window behind me. I looked round, and there, peering stealthily round the corner at us, was the face of the amanuensis. I confess that I was startled myself at the sight, for with its corpse-like pallor. The head might have been one which had been severed from his shoulders. He threw open the sash when he saw that he was observed. "'I'm sorry to interrupt you,' he said, looking in, "'but don't you think, Miss Warrender, that it is a pity to be boxed up on such a fine day in a close room? Won't you come out and take a stroll?' Though his words were courteous, they were uttered in a harsh and almost menacing voice, so as to sound more like a command than a request. The governess rose, and without protest or remark, glided away to put on her bonnet. It was another example of Copperthorne's authority over her. As he looked in at me through the open window, a mocking smile played about his thin lips, as though he would have liked to have taunted me with this display of his power, with the sun shining in behind him, he might have been a demon in a halo. 
He stood in this manner for a few moments, gazing in at me with concentrated malice upon his face. Then I heard his heavy footfall scrunching along the gravel path as he walked round in the direction of the door. That is the end of Part 1 of Uncle Jeremy's Household.